أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المبلومين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more on VES, your show, live from the holy city of Karbala. That is to say, back to the basics, you're joining me, your host, Yahya Seymour, in which we continue to discuss the previously laid out methodology, which we are now working through, inshallah ta'ala, in discussing and analyzing our beliefs as entire packages and worldviews, as opposed to isolated and individual doctrines. You will remember... For those of you who have been tuning in and for those who haven't, they can of course return back to the previous episodes. We have been discussing the fallacious approach taken in most discussions in regards to discussing the accuracy or inaccuracy of a particular set of beliefs. As opposed to discussing these beliefs as entire packages and comparing such sets, we have traditionally chosen to take, dare I say, a methodology of postmodernist deconstruction where we isolate one particular doctrine and we isolate it from the big and major questions and in doing so we try to highlight several mistakes in a worldview. Now this is of course a fallacious move because we've highlighted several reasons. This does not allow one to have the accurate amount of time in order to pursue and explore all the major varying philosophies, worldviews and religions in the world. Number two, to highlight a small secondary point which is not part of the major building blocks of Aqidah is to waste your time. It's a complete waste of my time to discuss whether or not scholar X from the Shia sect or scholar Y from the Sunni sect has a nicer style of tafsir. This is not a concern within the discussion as to which set of beliefs is correct. Likewise, it is not really something befitting for me to discuss whether scholar of Rajal Y or scholar of Rajal X has a slightly nicer system and is slightly more lenient on person Y from deviant sect X. Again, that would not form part of the major questions within a framework or package of beliefs. But in last night's episode, we were successfully able to move on to the first major question within any worldview, that is to say, what is the nature of God? And before we can even move on to that question, is there indeed a God? Is there a deity? Is there a creator who has created us within this system in order that we can know him? And we've stated that whilst certain people would like to argue that atheism is merely the abstract absence of a belief in a God or the negation in the belief in one particular deity and has no further consequences that this is entirely rejected by us because every belief has a consequence and every major belief has a major consequence. We observed in last night's episode in which we began to quote from some of the specialists in this field that this is not merely a believer's polemic against a non-believer. This is not merely the whims and desires of Yahya Seymour speaking against what the consequences of atheism or a godless worldview are. Rather, this is something that has been recognized, highlighted and accepted and even taken pride in by some of the major atheist thinkers of today's age. In last night's episode, I began citing, of course, one of the major atheist professors within the contemporary Western world. And again, not just a materialist who happens to dabble in minor issues of rationality, but rather someone specialized in the very discipline that we are concerned with, epistemology, the sources of knowledge. This individual, his name is Alex Rosenberg. And as I stated yesterday, he is the R. Taylor Cole Professor of Philosophy at Duke University, specializing in the philosophy of science. Not a field which, again, is something that any Tom, Dick or Harry or any internet polemicist can enter into. This is a man that's very specialized in his area of, of knowledge and a man who knows what he's talking about. In his book, The Atheist's Guide to Reality, he promotes the idea that atheism is not merely the abstract rejection of a belief in God. 
he doesn't buy that whole new atheist argument that I'm just someone who rejects God's existence. What do you mean there's other consequences? Rather, he embraces full-heartedly and even takes pride in embracing because he believes it's a sincere intellectual thing to do in acknowledging that his belief that there is no God and his belief in the truth of atheism leads to much more than just a rejection of a creator. What does he state? Let's quote once more what he states. He states, there is much more to atheism than its knockdown arguments that there is no God. Of course, he's talking about from his perspective. We're not too impressed with our arguments that there is no God. There is the whole rest of the world view that word I've been utilizing almost daily now, that comes along with atheism. It's a demanding, rigorous, breathtaking grip on reality, one that has been vindicated beyond reasonable doubt. It's called science. Alex Rosenberg again recognizes that there is a particular epistemology when it comes to atheism. That epistemology would be what we call scientism. So in this framework or theory of knowledge and how we learn things about the universe, Alex Rosenberg would say that the sources of knowledge which are adequate for us is what is called scientism. The belief that through the empirical sciences, through the five senses and the study of the three natural sciences, that is to say chemistry, physics and biology, these are the primary sources of knowledge. And indeed he would break that down further till we reach just the science of physics. A fact for Alex Rosenberg is a physical fact. It's a fact about the physical nature of something. So this is the epistemology of the new, improved, free thinkers of today. Those who believe that religion is superstitious. Those who believe that we as believers live in a backwards world in which we offer no rational thinking about the nature of the universe or indeed about life in general. Is that the case? Let's see who really has the primitive worldview here. Allow me to cite once more what this scientific or, scienti or scientism's worldview would be when it comes to some of the major questions. And indeed, fortunately for us, Professor Alex Rosenberg has done the heavy grafting for us and he, as a proponent and apologist, and indeed someone who is promoting this belief in naturalism, is putting forward these views as his answers to these major questions. He states, and I quote, Is there a God? Of course, as an atheist, his answer is no. What is the nature of reality? What physics says it is. So I was not doing a straw man argument earlier on. This is literally what Alex Rosenberg believes. What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. That makes perfect sense, of course, when he believes that the universe came out of absolute randomness, there is not going to be a purpose for it. What is the meaning of life? He says, and I quote, ditto, there is none. Why am I here? Alex Rosenberg responds, just dumb luck, pure chance. Does prayer work? Of course not. Is there a soul? Is it? immortal. So does a human being have such a thing known as a soul and is that soul immortal? He responds, are you kidding? And of course this is very natural, he's a, he's a physicalist, does not believe in the existence of non-physical entities. Interesting question next, is there free will? Alex Rosenberg's response, not a chance. What happens when we die? He responds, Everything pretty much goes on as before except us. Now this is one of the more interesting questions that is interesting for all the viewers regardless of a religious sect inshallah ta'ala. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? Uh, he says and I quote, there is no moral difference between them. Why should I be moral? He asks. Because it makes you feel better than being immoral. So he's a at the very least, he's a nice nihilist. Is abortion, euthanasia, suicide, paying taxes, foreign aid, or anything else you don't like? One, forbidden. Two, permissible. Or three, sometimes obligatory. So if we were to frame this in a different way, we could ask the question as, is there anything in life which is permissible, obligatory, or occasionally forbidden? His response, anything goes. Do what you want. 
What is love and how can I find it? His response, love is a solution to a strategic interaction problem. Don't look for it, it will find you when you need it. Now this is an interesting question here. Does history have any meaning or purpose? The past previous human endeavors, do they have meaning or purpose? He states, it's full of sound and fury but signifies nothing. Human history in its entirety, according to Alex Rosenberg, signifies absolutely nothing. Does the human past have any lessons for our future? Listen to this answer. Fewer and fewer if it ever had any to begin with. So this is the worldview that Alex Rosenberg is promoting. These are the answers to the bigger questions upon the materialistic scientific worldview of Alex Rosenberg. But dear viewers, we will come back to looking at this worldview when we go for a quick break. Join me after the break, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. What are some of the problems for Alex Rosenberg's worldview here? You'll remember when I went through the list of worldviews and how we would analyze each of them. I stated in last night's episode that we will be taking the very loyal Shi'i, Imami, Islamic and Muhammadan. And when I say Muhammadan, I don't say in the sense of Muhammadan, the word that these Western colonialist missionaries used to use. I say it, of course, referring back something to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for indeed we follow the original Islam. When we look at the Muhammadan and Imami principle of how to debate and analyze the arguments of others, we look at one of the principles which is known as Aidat al-Ilzam, to compel a group of people by the very principles by which they compel themselves and see how things end up. A principle very commonly utilized in books like Kitab al-Ihtajaj, which reflects the nature of the debates, the debate strategies utilized by the holy Imams, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all. And indeed we find this as well in the book Ayyun al-Akhbar al-Rawa alayhi salatu wassalam, in which we look at the debates of Imam Ali ibn Musa al riva alayhi salatu wassalam. This principle, we're now going to apply it to the worldview of Alex Rosenberg. And the first question we want to ask is, is this worldview livable? So let's look at this set of principles again. Is there a God? No. That's fine. We'll keep that belief to the side for now, even though it means that we are incapable of explaining where life and existence itself came from. But that's just something we're going to keep to the side because it has nothing to do with our livability right now. What is the nature of reality? Whatever physics says it is. So is that a livable way of approaching the world? Does it make sense of when someone gets home, when they want to have a conversation with others, we talk about things in a purely physical manner. We would describe everything we do purely from the perspective of physics, purely from the perspective of what the physical properties of things are. Does that seem to be a very livable way of living life? I think we all know the answer to that. What is the purpose of the universe? Again, we don't expect much more in an atheist worldview, none. What is the meaning of life? Again, nothing. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. Why does, does prayer work? No. Is there a soul? Is it immortal? Again, obviously upon atheism, you're not gonna find much of a answer to that because a materialistic worldview is not going to have room for an immaterial object like a soul. But this is the interesting one. Is there free will, not a chance? Okay, is that livable? Is that a very livable belief? When I go out on a day-to-day -day basis and someone irritates me, someone commits a crime against humanity and I look at that on the TV screen and I see that, look, I'm grotesquely offended by this crime which has been committed, um, especially if that crime is committed against someone like myself, I'm gonna be even more offended. Now, that's not necessarily the right way to look at things, but we as human beings can be very self-centered. If I adopt that belief that there's no such thing as free will, then 
Look at the ramifications and consequences of this belief. I'm going to start believing that, a, that criminals should not be prosecuted, nor should they be punished in a legitimate penal system, because at the end of the day, these poor guys were not in control of their actions. Rather, they were predestined to do everything that they did. They had absolutely zero choice in it. It's a bit like me programming and firing up a computer, getting that computer to do a task, and then complaining that the computer did something which it was programmed to do. If it has no free agency, then I can't blame it. And again, if we have no free will, then we should not blame criminals for acting in the way they do. We should not reprimand anyone for anything. Let's look at every single dimension of life that we could apply this not having free will. We all know that in universities, there are consequences for things like plagiarism. There are consequences for acting unethically in the area of sport. There are consequences for acting unethically in pretty much every single field of the workforce of today's world's population. Can you imagine what would happen if every time a person would be chastised, penalized, and dismissed from their job for acting inethically or unethically? We would be forced to say that, no, actually, this poor individual has not acted against the ethics of the company due to free will, but rather they were chemically predispositioned and physically predispositioned to act in the very way they did. You should not reprimand them for in the same way you do not choose what you do, these poor individuals have also not made that choice. This is one of the consequences of saying that there is no such thing as free will. And more importantly, if there is no such thing as free will, then we do hope that those militant atheists who go around attacking everybody for what they believe in would likewise take heed that, look, at the end of the day, according to your worldview, we don't really choose to believe in the things that we believe in. Rather, according to your worldview, I was chemically predispositioned to enter into Islam and believe in Islam, and you were chemically predispositioned to remain an atheist. This is the consequence of denying that we have a free will. It would lead to mass destruction on a societal level. There would be no such thing as courses of rehabilitation because at the end of the day, you would not be able to rehabilitate someone that has absolutely in zero intentionality or free human agency in the very thing that they do. And we can see why this leads to a level of what we could call cosmic despair. Because if you have absolutely zero choice in what you do, if you are merely the physical composition of a bunch of atoms and bosons floating around in space, nothing of your life is truly meaningful. All the relationships you have are merely the physical compounds in your brain causing you to act in a certain way. Everyone that finds you dear to them is only doing so because they have been chemically predispositioned to do so. Then what does that leave life as being? And again, what it would leave it as is exactly what Alex Rosenberg describes it as. What is the nature of reality? Whatever physics says it is. And that is the consequence. That is indeed the result of this modern day worldview, which promotes us as being nothing more than robots. When we talk of movies like iRobot, or other movies which contain futuristic concepts such as robots, robots who are just programmed to do what they do and unfortunately an evil guy takes over and somehow manages to change their programming and they do something but at the end of the day they don't have agency and they shouldn't really be punished for such they just get destroyed when you put forward the view that a human being is nothing more than an organic robot what kind of concept is that going to have for how you would treat other human beings? How are we going to think of other human beings if that's all that they are? Nothing more than organic robots. Organic units without the natural artificial intelligence even to make their own choices. We're going to start treating them as if they're cattle. We're going to start treating them worse than cattle because at least cattle, we believe, have a degree of free will. 
But this argument promotes the thought that we as human beings don't even have that agency in order to carry out our lives in the way that we do. This is one of the consequences of this worldview, and we see that it's not very livable. Again, what is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? There is no moral difference between them. So what does that mean? What does it mean to say that there's no moral difference between right and wrong, good and bad? What would be a consequence of that? Well, firstly, we've already seen that, obviously, if someone's chemically predisposed to do what they're meant to do, we can't really blame them for that anyway. But if we can't now say that an action, an action, independent of the actor and whether or not the actor has a choice, if we can't say that an action is good or bad, what's that going to lead us to? That's going to mean that, of course, someone's choice of what their favorite soft drink beverage is, is exactly the same as their choice of favorite crime and horrible act to commit as a means of taking someone's life. If my choice in regards to morality is no more different than my choice of, for example, breakfast cereal, then what kind of worldview is this going to be? How livable is it really going to be? Can you imagine that your son comes home and he, unfortunately, is someone that carries out all these crimes? A decent person, a decent person, is going to call the authorities and report their son for doing such. They're going to inform the authorities that, look, yes, it's my son, but he's doing all these things and for the greater good of society, this is really wrong, I'm going to stand against him. But if you believe that there's no such thing as right or wrong, what's that going to do to your image of how we ought to treat society? And so we need to ask, have people really considered the effects of disbelieving in the concept of God? Have people really considered what it does to your rational concepts, to your rational faculties. And if you really believe this, if you really believe there is no free will and that there's no such thing as right or wrong, are you in a livable position to start condemning others for what they believe in or how they act? These are all necessary points which I don't think many of the new atheists have considered, for indeed I don't think they've considered the fact that their belief in the absence of a God is not merely the absence of a belief, but rather an entire worldview itself. But these are all questions that I believe we need to ask. We need to ask when looking f towards which worldviews are sustainable, serious candidates for the table of different ideas. And this is something which, of course, we shall delve into further. But right now, as we can see, atheism doesn't seem to be making the cut. Dear viewers, thank you for joining me once more on this show, Back to the Basics. And inshallah ta'ala, we pray that you will join us tomorrow in which we continue analyzing the worldview of atheism. Please don't forget us in your du'as, and we will likewise not forget you here in Karbala in our du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.